Well, good afternoon. Welcome to the Kennedy Space Center. We're here to make an announcement about Kennedy's future initiatives and NASA's future initiatives. And today we have with us NASA Administrator Charlie Bowen, PSC Director Bob Cabana, and Jim Kuzma, the Chief Operating Officer of Space Florida. We'll have some opening comments from all our participants, and then we'll take your questions. Thanks very much, Lisa, and thanks very much for all of you coming down today. It's a, it's a big weekend, not just not just a big day, but a big weekend. But but there is uh, there's some business to take care of before we get into the weekend. So we thought we would do that first, and then let everybody have fun. Uh, I want to first of all uh, thank Governor Rick Scott, and I want to thank Frank Cavell of Space Florida, who've been working with NASA for quite some time now to make sure that the Florida Space Coast continues to play an indispensable role in America's civil space program. Their efforts at attracting more commercial partners like Boeing, Bigelow, Rocket Crashers, Lockheed Martin, and Sierra Nevada to the Space Coast are not only bolstering America's space program, they're bringing jobs and boosting the economy here in the region. And a strong space economy is good for the nation. For more than 50 years, the road to America's leadership in space exploration has run through far in the Kennedy Space Center. We intend to build on that success, and we envision an even greater role for the Space Coast as Kennedy transforms into a 21st century launch complex and plays a major role in the most ambitious missions in NASA's history, which include human journeys to an asteroid and on to Mars. Tomorrow marks the official grand opening of the Space Shuttle Atlantis exhibit at the Kennedy Space Center Visitor Complex. And uh, I have not seen it yet, but I have heard from many, 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 many people uh, that it is absolutely spectacular. So I look forward to seeing it this afternoon. But we're here today, or at least this time, to make it clear that the end of the shuttle program tells the beginning of a new era in human space life. With much of it happening right here at Kennedy. In fact, with the help of Space Florida and Lockheed Martin, Kennedy's historic operations and checkout facility has been transformed into a final assembly and testing site for the Orion spacecraft, which will carry humans farther into space than ever before and make its first uncrewed test flight next year. In early June, Orion passed a critical series of static load and pressure tests designed to simulate conditions it will encounter in flight. The progress is being made to transform KFB at Kennedy's Launch Complex 39 to support our heavy lift rocket, the Space Launch System, and other commercial launch vehicles. And this week, at the Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, Alabama, engineers tested the adapter that will connect Orion to the Delta IV rocket that will launch it on its test flight next year. In 2011, NASA announced the establishment of our commercial crew program here at the Kennedy Space Center. Last year, we selected three companies, Boeing, Sierra Nevada, and SpaceX to develop the capabilities to help us to once again launch our astronauts from American soil to the International Space Station. Since then, all three companies have set up shop here on the Space Coast. It's time to stop outsourcing that work to foreign countries. It's time to bring those jobs back home. We plan to do just that within the next four years. So the young man standing right over there is wondering what in the world is going on here. Uh, and may one day be in his place, uh, running the Kennedy Space Center, and be very proud that, that we're launching Americans from here again. SpaceX has already launched two successful cargo resupply missions to the ISS from the Space Coast, and Orbital Sciences is preparing to launch its first cargo mission from our Wallops Flight Facility on the eastern shore of Virginia in coming weeks. Our commercial crew partners have all recently announced the completion of important milestones to keep us on track for our capability to launch U.S. astronauts from American soil later this decade. And all of them are on track to complete all of their milestones on schedule. We're also moving forward with plans to repurpose some of our dormant shuttle facilities. Today, we're pleased to announce that we're entering into negotiations with Space Florida to take over operation of the Kennedy Shuttle Landing Facility for use as a combined airport and spaceport. This will continue to expand Kennedy's viability as a multi-user spaceport and continue to strengthen the economic opportunities for Florida and the nation. We look forward to working with Space Florida over the coming months to finalize the details of this transition 
All of this demonstrates our commitment and progress in building a strong commercial space industry so that American companies are providing safe, reliable, and cost-effective transportation to and from the International Space Station and other low-Earth orbit destinations. NASA's investment in commercial space is paying off for the American taxpayer, and it's allowing us to focus on challenges we need to overcome to reach an asteroid in Mars. We're excited about the innovation and resourcefulness of our commercial partners and look forward to many milestones ahead. And now it's my privilege to ask um, a, a very good friend of mine, a longtime friend of mine, fellow Marine uh, and the director of the Kennedy Space Center, Bob Cabana, to come up. But I want to say one thing about Bob while he's on his way. You know, we could, um, there could be anybody running the Kennedy Space Center. Uh, I'm not sure anybody could do what Bob has done in the period of time he's been here. This has been very difficult. Um, we, get, we all get emotional about it. Uh, Kennedy is going through a transition. And it is one like I think the American space program has ever seen before. The transition from Apollo to uh, Apollo, Soyuz, and Skylab, and then to shuttle uh, took place over a period of time, but that was a transition uh, to lower orbit operations. And one that, that, although not very easy because of the vehicle involved, the lean vehicle, but one that was much more easy than what, what Bob has been encountering here at the Kennedy Space Center. So uh, I want to publicly thank him for everything he's done. He's been awesome. Um, I'm privileged to call him a friend and a colleague, and so I'll talk to Yes. Well, thank you, Charles. Hey, this really is a great weekend uh, to be at the Kennedy Space Center, and I, I want to thank Charlie for coming down to, uh, to be a part of this. Uh, this announcement that Space Florida is uh, going to take over uh, maintenance, operations, and development of the shuttle landing facility is part of our transition to a, a multi-user spaceport. It's key uh, to our future success. Uh, it's really important, and I really appreciate the partnership that we have had with Space Florida and the investments they have made helping us through this transition to bring commercial operations here to the Cape. Uh, I think this is absolutely uh, fantastic. Uh, we still got a lot of work to do. But, uh, you know, when I look back on the progress that we have made over the past uh, couple of years in this transition, it truly is amazing. Oftentimes, we, we tend to look at where we are and not how far we've come. And we are making huge progress towards becoming what we want to be. Uh, we're making it with uh, SLS MPCB and preparing to go explore beyond lower Earth orbit. We're making it within the commercial crew program, getting drives for our astronauts to our space station on an American vehicle. And we're making it bringing jobs here and actually commercializing space and making it happen with our excess capacity. Uh, we've had a number of great um, agreements that we've put in place to help lower our maintenance costs, but also to bring jobs and commercialize space operations here at the Cape. And a lot of that has been done in partnership with Space Florida. So I, I'm really glad all you can be here. Uh, I hope that you get a chance to get over and see this fantastic new facility that we have. Uh, but more importantly, you know, the future behind us. Uh, we have an extremely bright future. We are making it happen. And uh, a lot of it is in the partnerships that we have that are key for our future success. And uh, one of the major keys has been Space Florida, and I'd like to introduce uh, a fellow Naval Academy graduate. We've got three of us up here. Uh, Jim Kuzma, retired Navy captain uh, with Space Florida, and he has a few words he'd like to say. Thank you. Good afternoon, uh, Mr. Air Bowen and uh, Bob, on behalf of the governor and Frank Bell, we appreciate uh, not only the, the uh, trust to uh, and negotiate both the operations of the shelf landing facility, but all the other partnerships we have. And truly, your staff has been tremendous in negotiating and working with us to achieve the goal of bringing more information to more business and commercial business to the Space Coast. Uh, we look forward to uh, enhancing and facilitating new and emerging suborbital launch providers, unmanned systems, as well as other aerospace development companies here. And, and truly, Bob, as you talked about, we are looking to use this development and research with your team, right your team, sir. We look forward to doing that very near future. So thanks very much. Okay, we're ready for questions. We do have a mic in the back, but uh, I'm not sure we're really getting this right in the hand. Anybody have any questions? Okay, thank you. Uh, one question for Ben, sir. Oh, you commanded Atlantis, so obviously this is a 
big name, big people on you. What are your thoughts about what makes this a different complex? Can you give us a little preview, a sneak preview about what you can see more? Yeah, um, I'm going to let Bob give you a sneak preview because I haven't seen it. But your, the question he asked was, I commanded it, man, it? You know, every time you fly, people always ask, what was, the, what was your best flight? What was your favorite flight? What was the most important thing? What was the most memorable thing on that night? I find it very difficult to separate anything out. Uh, it was all incredible. Uh, every vehicle was different. Um, I was privileged to fly Columbia, Atlantis, and Discovery twice. Uh, Atlantis has a special uh, connection with me, however, because it was the first it was a vehicle that I flew the first time I actually commanded the shuttle and um, had an absolutely incredible crew that flew 24-hour ops, so around-the-clock operations, two shifts and everything, um, and, and it was NASA's mission, first mission to planet Earth, which, considering what the President announced this past week about, uh, you know, climate change initiatives and the focus of NASA, uh, that was actually right dead in the heart of that. That was 1992. And here we are, you know, 2013, and we're still struggling with issues of climate change. So that that flight meant a lot to me. It was very special, I think, for the nation and the world. And uh, and you will probably see me get emotional. So that's why I'm trying. I'm going to try not to talk to anybody uh, in the media and stuff like that as I go through this. Uh, Pam Adams over there will be holding my hand. My wife is here. Who will be saying, "Please don't cry." Uh, so let me let Bob give you a preview of what we're going to see. It is awesome. It is spectacular. Uh, we showcase Atlantis, uh, but it tells the 30-year history of the shuttle program and the amazing team that, that made it all happen. Uh, I think we display Atlantis uh, like no other orbiter, uh, and folks are going to get to see it as only a very few have on orbit. It truly looks as if it is flying in space, and it is, it's, you get so close you can about that close to being able to touch it. And uh, it, it's just, uh, it'll bring a tear to your eyes. It, it will capture the imagination of another generation. It will continue to expire as it starts off on its on its second mission in life. It was a phenomenal spaceship. Uh, it helped us explore and discover. And now it's going to lead a, uh, a mission of inspiration uh, to future scientists, engineers, and explorers. And it's absolutely fantastic. And I, I want to thank uh, Delamore North, our uh, operator of our visitor center, for the outstanding job that they did working with us uh, to get this facility done on time and to be able to display it in a way that we can share it uh, with the entire world. Uh, it is, it, it's, it's more than you can possibly imagine. I, I think you're going to be blown away when you see it. Uh, I was. It, it's, it's pretty special. Thanks. Question for Administrator Golden. Um, you hear a lot of controversy and discussion today about whether NASA is going to go back to the moon or to Mars or to an asteroid. What is the most important next step in your mind for future human space exploration? Oh, the most important next step for the future of human space exploration is for us to get through this period of uh, very difficult work with our three contractors, SpaceX, Boeing, and Sierra Nevada to uh, get to the point where we can select one or more uh, providers of that service so that we get the capability to carry Americans back into space uh, from American soil. That's the most important next step, and it's critical because that's the step that allows us to continue to source uh, or resource the International Space Station, um, and then doing that is critical because we cannot continue our exploration program without uh, the unique capability of the only uh, on orbit microgravity facility for research and development known to me, uh, and that's the International Space Station. Then come things that we've been talking about that we get really excited about an asteroid mission that's going to help us to demonstrate the capabilities, some of the technical capabilities that we don't currently have that are going to be necessary to, to proceed on to Mars. Uh, also, um, give us an opportunity to see. If some of our theories about um, you know potentially protecting the Earth are true, or are good, or valid, um, and also uh, we've got a, a group of new explorers, like, you know, eight new astronauts or astronaut candidates, as we call them, who will report for duty um, in August to get started. They're a very unique breed of cat. I like to tell people because um, I can only speak for myself, Bob. 
probably would agree with me though, I don't think we would make it if we had been aligned with the 6,300 people who applied in this group from which we could aid. Um, every single one of them has uh, potential has potential for learning multiple languages. They all will be fluent in, in Russian by the time they get through the indoctrination. Uh, they all will do spacewalks. They all will be, have a capability to do remote manipulator system operations. Bob and I are both pilots. Uh, he learned Russian because he lived here for a year or more. Um, neither of us had an opportunity to do a spacewalk because we were pilots and back then pilots didn't do it. And uh, I think we all had a chance to tinker with the arm, but not to the extent of these. Are. So, you know, a lot of different things we have to do with them. They're all, they're all interconnected. So anybody who, who tries to separate out NASA's problems now and, and find out what is most important and most critical, it's all intertwined. And, and, and they're all sort of in line. If anything doesn't go, uh, then we're, we're interrupted in our progress to get humans to Mars at some point, and hopefully in our lives. Okay. Uh, Dan Dillow from West TV. <clears throat> Hopefully, I asked two questions one for General Bolden and one for Carlos Savannah. Uh, General Bolden, uh, what are your hopes for that asteroid mission that you've touched on? How important is that? And what are your concerns that you know funding will intervene and you won't be able to get it off or get it off on time? Well, let me answer the first one first. The second one first. And I'm always concerned about funding. Uh, you know, the president proposes and the Congress disposes. So, uh, you know, any president can have incredible visions. John F. Kennedy, um, everybody remembers Kennedy's Rice University speech when he said, you know, within this decade, we're going to send a man to the moon and bring him safely to back home to Earth. Uh, that would have been just empty speech had not the Congress of the United States appropriated the funds for the Apollo program. And they were significant funds appropriated for, for the Apollo program. When you look at the graph of NASA funding, uh, it goes off the page during the Apollo programs. Uh, you know, we need the support of the Congress, and, and that is absolutely necessary. Um, so that's my, my concern about funding. Going back to the, to the first question, what do I hope to get out of it? The, the, the asteroid initiative, and, and we need to speak about an initiative because it's not just a mission. It's a three-segmented initiative the most important of which is, what, is one that we, we have had underway for decades, and President Obama has proposed adding another $20 million to the effort, and that's to identify and characterize everything that can come from space that would threaten Earth. So that's, that's all potentially hazardous objects, PHOs, as people like to call them. Potentially hazardous objects coming toward Earth. We, we don't have a way right now to effectively identify those that are smaller, and say a thousand meters, which is big, really big. Those are civilization destroying. But the city destroying, the region destroying asteroids, we, we don't have as good a capability as we need. So we're going to need additional uh, ground based assets and then some space based assets. We're working with industry, academia, private enterprises now to develop that capability. That's the first segment. The second segment is the asteroid mission itself, which has nothing to do with humans. It's a robotic mission. Um, we plan to use solar electric propulsion. The, the shortcoming there, the technological challenge, is solar arrays that can allow us to provide a, uh, an engine that's in a 30 to 50 um, kilowatt range. And that's pretty big, you know, solar electric engine. Today we use uh, you know, 2 kilowatts, maybe something as big as 10, but, but we just don't have the technological capability to get there yet. So, so it's very important that we do that. When we demonstrate that capability, it opens up the universe for further exploration by robotic enterprises, uh, you know, communications companies, other kinds of companies. So it's a big deal. And then finally, the asteroid mission that involves humans, where we use SLS and Orion to take a crew to the state of orbit around the moon, where we hope to redirect that asteroid where they can interact with it. Uh, just a quick question about employment at the Kennedy Space Center. Is, is the needle moving uh, back toward uh, more jobs yet, or where, where do we stand on? No, Dan, we're still uh, pretty flat where we are. And as we continue to grow this uh, commercial base, it, it'll start picking up. But right now, we're still around 8,500, and it's going to stay that way for a while. And it'll be, uh, you know, a year or more before we start ramping back up. But again, you know, it'll never be what it was for an example. 
follow up. It's a it's a different kind, but I think it's definitely a, a positive atmosphere here. Things are improving greatly on a on a weekly basis. Um, Scott Holmes from NewsPlusNotes.com, and this is for you, for Fred Golden. What importance do you have, or could you just say a few words about facilities like the Kennedy Space Visitor Center? in regards to inspiring youth towards the careers, but also gaining public support for NASA has, um, it, our education program has a variety of kinds. One is formal education. So you will see our STEM education program goes directly to teachers and students in school. Uh, a very important part of our, of our education program is what we call informal education. That is the Kennedy Space Center, Challenger Learning Centers, the, the um, California Science Center out in LA, Intrepid Museum, all the museum, museums and forums around the world with whom we work. And they play a critical role because schools cannot reach everyone. Um, it is places like the Kennedy Space Center that bring people from all over the world to see things that they would otherwise never see in their lives. Um, as Bob said, you, you know, there are not a lot of places where you're going to be able to get as close to an order as you're going to be able to get when you get inside the Atlantis exhibit here. There is nowhere else in the world that you will be able to see an orbiter that looks the way it looks when it's in, when it's in flight in space. Uh, that is a very, 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 very unique opportunity to see it in a unique configuration. Even when uh, we were processing orbiters here and the payload big doors were open, let me tell you, you didn't even, you couldn't recognize it with an orbiter because it was, you know, all wrapped around with platforms and stuff like that, and you just, you didn't know that there was a vehicle in there. You're going to see the orbiter the way that another approaching vehicle would have seen it on orbit, or the way that a spacewalking astronaut out on the arm or working on the International Space Station would have seen it, with the payload bay doors open, looking down in the payload bay. Uh, and I haven't seen the exhibit, but I think most importantly, as Bob says, it is going to be a part of the progression of human, human, the story of human spaceflight, most critically helping young people like her or her or some of the other kids that are around here understand that, you know, what those little guys did, that was great. But that's nothing compared to what I'm going to do. Because I'm going to go beyond the work of I'm going to be one that's going to be on the asteroid mission. I'm going to be one that's going to be the first to stand on another planet. Human beings have been dreaming of standing on another planet um, since long before uh, the Wright brothers invented the airplane, long before Lindbergh flew the Atlantic. Uh, that has always been a dream of humanity, and we're, we're perilously close to having the capability to do that. But it goes back to the question over here. Um, it has got to be a collaboration between the Congress and the President, supported by you, the American public. So you play as critical a role in, in seeing that come about as anything, and that's what's the, the real importance of places like uh, like the Kennedy Visitor Center is helping to convince you that we're not just about fancy. You know, we're not just we're not just dreaming. Um, this is real. We can do this. And by having an opportunity to see Atlantis, something that uh, you know, when when Bob and I were growing up, man, that was science fiction. That would that would have never happened. A winged vehicle flying around Earth and then coming back and landing on the runway. Buck Rogers did that kind of stuff, but he didn't land on a winged vehicle. I think he gave us a I mean, it, this is an opportunity to see the progression we've made, but more importantly, to see where we're going in the future. And that, that's critically important for this one. Any final questions? Okay, thank you for coming.